at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it is now being revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together in one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, the grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things." His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory." For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of this glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Well, that's a large chunk of Bible we just read, right? And some of you are probably thinking, what's going on? We usually cover like three verses a week and suddenly we're just going to do all of Ephesians chapter three in one week. Is that so? And, and the answer to that question is yes. We are going to cover all of chapter three in just this one sermon. And the reason for that is because a lot of the first half of the chapter is really just Paul briefly reviewing what he's already written as a way of explaining his ministry and mission in the world. I mean, it's his way of describing him as the apostle to the Gentiles. So the first 13 verses of chapter 3, it's really just Paul explaining or reminding his readers who he is and and what his ministry is all about. He, He tells them that he has accepted God's call to be a servant who goes and tells the world, specifically uh, the non-Jewish world, about the things that he has written about up to this point in his letter. That people are saved not by adhering to the law of the Old Testament or to rules or by good deeds, but by God's grace alone through faith in Jesus. And that regardless of their background, cultural or otherwise, once they are saved by God's grace, they are heirs to eternal life. And they have peace with God and they can approach God as his dear child with confidence and freedom in his love. It's all stuff Paul has already written about in the first two chapters of this letter to the Ephesians. So so right here in chapter 3, what we look at today, he doesn't dwell on it again. And so we are not going to dwell on it again either. We already looked at those things earlier in this series. So we move on with Paul, who goes on to indicate that previously, a lot of this stuff that he's been writing about, it was a mystery. It was hidden by God. All the people had before, if anything, was the law of the Old Testament, which was given to point out the people that they needed to be saved. You see, people thought when they got the law, it's like, well, if I just live by this, this will save me by keeping the law. But they found out real fast that the law couldn't save them when they kept failing at the law. They, they, they kept falling away. They, they, they kept breaking it. So the law didn't save them or anyone. 
So the people, since they had the law, they looked at the law, they sought to obey the law as a way of obeying God, as an indication of their faith in God, because they had faith that God would save them. They would be saved somehow. But how they would be saved was a mystery up to this point, to, to Paul's time, when God revealed his plan for salvation through Jesus Christ. People were and are saved by grace through faith in Christ. This is the mystery revealed, and it's a truth on which the church is founded, and within the church we celebrate, and we live out this truth so that the rulers of the heavenly realms, the angels and demons alike, Paul, Paul says, the rulers of the, the, the heavenly realms, they can witness the greatness of God as revealed in the mystery of the church's people. That's us being saved by Christ. Paul says, this is what my ministry is. And that's the first part of Ephesians chapter 3. What Paul does here kind of reminds me of a long time ago in my life when, when I was doing marketing at, at the First National Bank of Slippery Rock. The powers that be came in one day and told us all, hey, by the way, we're merging with a much larger bank. They don't need you, so your jobs in a couple months are going to be gone. Fun times. And so to try to soften the blow, they, they brought in a job uh, search coaching firm to, to try to train us all and how to find new job opportunities and how to interview and all such things. And one of the things they drilled into us was that we needed to compose and memorize a one minute summary of our professional selves. So, that, hey, you know how you, you go into an interview and you get that inevitable, que inevitable question. It's usually one of the first things the interviewer asks you. They say, so tell me about yourself. And if you're not prepared, you, you, you just kind of try to fumble around for words. You stutter, you mutter, you try to say something intelligent uh, about what you're about. But they said, you have this ready so that you have a concise summary all planned out to tell prospective employees. This is what you need to know about me. This is what I'm about. So you're not stuttering. You're not stammering for intelligent sounding things. It's just here it is concisely. Here is why I'm the best and why you should hire me. This is what I'm after. And that's pretty much what Paul is doing in the first 13 verses of today's passage. It's like it's his one minute summary and the readers, hey, us today, we are the interviewers. He reminds them, hey, this is what I'm all about. That's the message that I suffer in order to bring to you and to all people. That's the foundation of my ministry as an apostle. Here it is, bam, these 13 verses right there. And then in the remainder of the verses in chapter 3, Paul pretty much goes on to tell his readers, hey, as that guy, the guy I just talked about, the apostle called by God to be the steward of that message, the, the most important message in the history of the world, as that guy... I want you to know I am praying for you. I am praying that you get the message and that you get it fully. And that's an important prayer, I think, because a lot of times in the church, so many of us in the church, well, well we get the message. We, we understand it on a surface level. But so many of us don't get the message fully. Interestingly, in order for his readers that's us today, in order for us to understand fully, Paul writes that he is praying for his readers to receive power. Power, right? Take another look at what Paul writes in verse 16. He writes, I pray that out of his glorious riches, hey folks, that's code for grace. So it's like he's praying. He says, I pray that out of God's glorious grace, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Paul says he desires God to strengthen us through power from the Holy Spirit. And in verses 17 and 18, he literally writes, I pray that you may have power. Oh, we like power, don't we? So Paul's kind of saying, I want you to be like He-Man, right? Holds up his sword and he says to God, I have the power. I just want to say that that's two weeks in a row now that I've managed to sneak in a reference to He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, so Mattel, the toy company, needs to start paying me royalties or something. But that's what Paul says. Like, I want you to have power. Just think of all the things we as the church could do with all this power Paul is praying that we would receive. I mean, we would get done doing all the things God tells us we need to be doing. 
We could make sure, hey, everyone's living right. Everyone's doing what God says. Everyone's living the right way. Everyone's living our way. We could finally be in control. Oh, we love that, don't we? But Paul pretty much here says, no, 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 no. That's not why I want you to have power. In our passage today, Paul writes, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love. See, Paul writes that we need God's power to grasp and to know the love of Christ. You see, we come to church, we make church about a lot of stuff, don't we? Different things. Our life in Christ means you come to worship every week. Or you you go to Sunday school, or you, you, you do all the right things. You got to say all the right things. You watch all the right TV shows, right? You got to give enough money. You got to give to the right things. You give to the church, you give to missions, right? Uh, you know, if for people like me, the temptation is to place the emphasis on our service to God. How much and how well are we serving? And those may all be important things, important parts of the life of a follower of Jesus. But they're not the first. They're not the number one things we need to get and understand. The primary thing we need to grasp and understand is the love of Christ. So many within the church, we kind of get uh, 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 just a surface level understanding, an introductory level understanding of that, but then we don't bother to grasp or to grapple with that. We don't bother to go deeper. Instead, we get, we get that surface level understanding, all right, Jesus loves us, and then we go off chasing after all the other things, some of the things I, I just named a few moments ago, even things of our faith that are important. And so we're out there, we're trying to do them for God, and we end up just falling short in our faith. We fall short in our relationship with God. We fall short in our efforts to know God better because we haven't fully grasped the number one thing, the love of Christ. It is hard to grasp and understand the love of Christ fully because the love of Christ is so glorious. It's so big. It's so big that even the Apostle Paul just doesn't seem to have the words to describe it. Now, we know from from all of Paul's writings in the New Testament, there are a lot of them. So we know that Paul knew a lot of words and he knew how to string them together. And, And there were at times complex things God desired to communicate to his church through Paul. And so somehow, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul found the words necessary to communicate those things. But here in today's passage, when it comes to the gloriousness of Christ's love, Paul just seems to be out of words, out of the right words. So he just kind of keeps adding modifiers and he kind of keeps talking around. If I keep talking about it, like, like the thing people do sometimes when, when they ha- get a question put to them and they, they're expected to have an answer, but they just don't have an answer. So they just start talking and they start rambling and just saying words, right? And they just keep coping. Eventually something's going to, to tumble out. Uh, they're going to stumble into something that makes sense. It's kind of what Paul was doing here today. Paul pretty much, he's just writing, you know, Christ's love, it's, it's, well, it's wide. It's long and high and it's deep. Yeah, it's deep. You know, and he, he just keeps adding things, right? Right. There's an old children's song we used to sing in church when I was a kid. Maybe some of you sang it and you remember it and it had motions. And so maybe as I do it here, maybe you want to join me, right? Because if you recognize it, you'll know it, right? It's deep and wide, deep and wide. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Yeah, good. It's, it's that song. It's a song that compares the love of Christ to a fountain that flows, well, deep and wide. And you would think talking about a flow of water that is deep and wide, well, that's big, that's like the ocean, deep and wide, right? That that covers it. But Paul kind of says here, nah, (laughs) deep and wide, that's too small. The love of Christ is much bigger. It's, It's just huge. It's wide and high, and long, and deep, and he just keeps putting words on because it's otherwise inexpressible. 
the love of Christ is so big that we need the power of God to even begin to know it. So that's what Paul prays. He says he prays that his readers receive power from the Spirit in order to understand and grasp and to know Christ's love. You can't possibly even begin to understand and to know the love of Christ in your own strength and your own power. You need God. Again, you need God for even this. By his Holy Spirit, God has to come into your life and empower you to know it. And I must confess that, that, that the ideas in this next part of our discussion here today, uh, I am deeply indebted uh, to Pastor J.D. Greer, who's one of my favorite preachers to listen to. I mow for hours on end, and often I just listen to J.D. Greer preach. But Pastor J.D. asks, how long is Christ's love? As Paul says, Christ, love of Christ is long. How long is Christ's love? Well, Paul explained earlier in this letter to the Ephesians that it's from all of eternity and for all of eternity. God chose us from before the foundation of the world. You might remember us kind of talking about that a few weeks back. And that means that there's never been a time when God did not know about you. There's never been a time when God did not love you. And there will never be a time in the future when God quits loving you. Christ's love is that long. How high is Christ's love? Well, King David writes in Psalm 103.11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Christ's love is as high as the heavens. The sun, the moon, the stars, they're out there, right? High above the earth. That's what King David's saying. And with our technology today, we know much more about how high that is than King David, David ever could. Take a look at this picture. This picture is from the Hubble telescope. The Hubble telescope now sends back infrared images of faint galaxies 12 billion light years away. And so just so you know, one light year is 6 trillion miles. Uh, that, that's a 6 with, with uh, 12 zeros after it. So 12 billion light years... That's an 84 with 21 zeros after it miles away. God's love can't even be contained in those numbers. That's how high the love of Christ is. How wide is the love of Christ? Well, Christ's love is so wide it extends to control every molecule of the universe, subjecting everything in pursuit of his good purpose in our lives. See in the world, on this earth alone, one planet. Scientists estimate there are 1.33 times 10 to the 50, that's a 10 with 50 zeros after it, atoms. That's, that's a lot of atoms, right? That's how many atoms there are on the earth. Eh, give or take one or two. And that doesn't include all the atoms and the subatomic particles that are found in all the rest of the universe. That's just one planet. And yet there is not one stray atom not one stray electron, not one stray quark in all the galaxies where Christ's love does not uh, extend wide to cover. That's how wide the love of Christ is. How deep is the love of Christ? Well, here we get a little bit more theological with the Apostle Paul and Pastor J.D. Pastor J.D. says Christ's love is so deep, he'd reach all the way down into the filth of sin and the grave of death to make a wretch his treasure. He literally became sin and death for us, dying in our place, so we didn't have to. That's how deep the love of Christ is. It goes deeper than all our sin. See, Paul wants his readers to grasp the length, the height, the depth, the width of God's love. It's so huge that even he, an apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit, cannot fully describe it. The love of Christ is the kind of love you cannot explain. It has to be grasped by God's power in us. It has to be experienced in order to be known. And so that's why Paul prays that God's people would have power, not so that they can dominate or control or even get the work done, but so they can know his love, they can experience it, they can live in it and live in it more fully. 
We need to know and experience the love of God more fully because God calls us to love. You know, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is from God. And many of us, we're familiar with Jesus' response, right? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus calls us to love God and to love others. And we can do that. We can be agents of God's love, but only once we ourselves have grasped and known the greatness of God's love in our lives. If we go out and we try to do it without first knowing the love of God ourselves, we're going to fail. And I think that's one of the reasons the church of Jesus is failing in so many ways today. Because we just want to go out and be the church, but we first, within the church, we are not first intent on seeking God's power to know his love more fully in our own lives. We are not seeking to grasp God's love. You see, only when we experience the fullness of God's love does God even become real to us. Only then will we be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, as Paul writes in verse 19. And only then will we love him in return more than everything else. And only then can we go out and be true, real expressions of God's love to other people. And only then will we live in the truth with which Paul closes chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Folks, Paul prays. He says, seek the Spirit's power so that you can know the love of God. You can know the love of Christ more and more. How high and long and deep and wide. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for loving us. And, and, and we confess, God, we don't even understand the, 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 the depth, uh, the bigness, the hugeness of your love for us and for this world, the people of this world. And God, we, we try to respond to your love without even stopping to consider it. And so we go out and we, we kind of mess up, God forgive us for that and make us people who 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 are intent on seeking you seeking your power your strength to know your love more and more every day drive us toward that god uh don't make us so goal oriented that we just see the goals that we need to get out to and do before we just seek to know you and your love let us know it so that then out, out of out of a response to you and your love we can love you more and then we can go love other people then we can uh, love them and, and you in, in ways that, that set us to, toward the other things we pursue as followers of Jesus. But let us see and know and experience your love more deeply first. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.